Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lucas, and good morning to everybody. Um, it's a chilly Saturday morning, so I think we all appreciate the fact that there are um, people in the audience. I'm here in a little bit of a different role today, much more, I'd say, my role as, um, as a teacher. And um, in sh shortly, you'll be hearing from us uh, uh, you'll be hearing from our MA students who have been working uh, on a, a set of investigations, some of which took them to Rotterdam and Amsterdam. Um, we'll hear more about that presumably from Lorenzo Pizzani, but uh, um, I thought I would begin with just uh, making some reflections on artistic practice and sort of research today, so much more um, as Lucas said last night, the academy is really gathered around um, sort of changes in the ways in which we might conceptualize the role of research vis-a-vis -vis, um, artistic and creative uh, forms of kind of practice um, today. But before I, I begin with my uh, brief comments, I just wanted to extend a really uh, heartfelt and very important uh, thank you to Sonic Axe for facilitating um, our field trip here to, to Rotterdam, including the students and their, uh, and their research materials in, in today's sort of symposium. So thank you very much for this sort of ongoing collaboration and the interest in the work that we, we do. Um, so let me begin by, as I said, making a few brief comments, and then um, I hope that they will sort of signal some of the, the ways in which we might take up the challenge of, of research within the context of uh, contemporary forms of creative expression and practice. So I feel that this year's Sonic Axe Academy offers a timely context to both consider and assess a series of critical shifts that are fundamentally changing the character of postgraduate study within the academy today, especially in practice-based programs such as art, architecture, design, film and video, media, etc. And this is namely the incorporation of research tendencies that draw upon the conceptual resources and methodological provocations from other domains. And a handful of those that we work with in the Center for Research Architecture, where I teach, would be the, the experimental conditions of the laboratory in which ideas are prototyped and tested, the investigative techniques of new forms of journalism that utilize online tools for accessing and aggregating information from across disparate domains and remote geographies, the mapping of all kinds of events and situations enabled by public domain remote sensing systems, such as Google Earth or the Landsat series of Earth observation satellites, uh, new approaches in archaeology that are non-invasive, that don't require the kind of physical digging into the ground. You can use techniques such as ground penetrating radar, for example. Um, so this kind of inv non-invasive archaeology explores landscapes and objects as sites of memory in which densely encrypted histories are encoded. Um, other methods might be the persuasive and rhetorical capacities of non-human entities that organize the fields of law in which contestations around truth increasingly reside in material forms of expression, and um, also the algorithmic logics of automated decision-making that organize themselves across all domains of contemporary life. So these are some of the, I feel, some of the kind of conceptual uh, domains from which we actually start to extract different, uh, as I said, resources and methods for doing our work. And I, in some way, the trajectory of my own graduate studies has also mirrored these changes. So I began with a uh, Master's of Fine Arts at the University of California, San Diego, in which studio practice was largely organized around our personal interests. There was no demands at all that the work be, would be productive of research insights. And this is despite the fact that you know, the highly charged politics of the U.S.-Mexico border had already long galvanized a whole set of artistic practices in San Diego and Tijuana that were very activist and interventionist in nature, but they certainly weren't conceptualized as, as productive of research insights. 
Um, when I moved to the UK to pursue my doctoral work in cultural studies, the writing of an extended e thesis eclipsed the, eclipsed the practical dimensions of the program. Art wasn't regarded as, a, as having a particularly significant role to play as a site of research and proposition making. Its role was subservient to writing and continues in large part to, be, uh, to do so and to be so. Um, this is very, and I'm not talking about the kinds of material explorations that we might engage with within a sort of traditional kind of studio, um, uh, studio settings or studio practices. So ultimately, this um, situation that I encountered actually at Cultural Studies in Goldsmiths was also why I eventually chose to migrate my PhD to the newly constituted Center for Research Architecture where I work today, as research architecture was predicated upon trying to grapple specifically with this problematic. And I'm, I may return to this if, um, when we, we opened up to the kind of general um, collective discussion. One of the central provocations that ultimately guided my dissertation project was the abiding question posed by Erit Rogoff, who Nora uh, also invoked last night as part of the Free Thought Collective. And Erit posed this question that I think is really fundamental, and it was, how does practice retroactively perform itself as research? In my mind, this is a crucial challenge as studio arts and practice-based programs are rapidly undergoing a conceptual makeover aimed at retooling them into knowledge-producing enclaves in order to meet established definitions and models of scholarly work within higher education research institutes. Access to research funding elsewhere relies upon the ability of these programs to position themselves firstly as knowledge production systems with delineated outcomes rather than as merely sites of creative exploration and experimentation. Yet surely all that takes place within such environments can't simply default to the realm of research activities. A dilemma thus arises. If artists and architects in our case need to be taken seriously as graduate scholars, and increasingly as doctoral candidates, then their modes of practice must, by extension, be understood as a form of knowledge production. At present, this remains the prevailing paradigm for framing all graduate research. However, rather than focusing exclusively on the question of what, what is knowledge, what is research, what is an artwork's discursive and practical relationship to these concerns, it is surely, um, equally useful to elaborate the question of how. How does knowledge happen? How are processes of explication activated and intensified across domains of thought and material configurations? How do we recognize when research is taking place or are being produced within studio and practice-based environments? How might the conception of research itself need to undergo a radical reformulation in order to adapt to these emergent practice-based programs? And of course, the question of what returns, but hopefully differently. What kinds of evaluative criteria can be brought to bear upon such activities and by whom? What types of theoretical understandings and dissemination strategies are required to articulate the research dimensions of our practices? In one of my graduate seminars that I took at Goldsmiths while a PhD student, uh, someone who's now a colleague, Suhail Malik, who teaches in the art practice critical study stream of, of the art program at Goldsmiths. We are working with Suhail, and we we're trying to, to grapple with some of these questions, and a useful observation was made that in the making and doing of art, something happens that precedes the knowing of what has happened which is to say that contrary to the ways in which scientific domains understand their debates, artistic and creative practices aren't necessarily predicated upon knowledge formation as their primary objective. An artist or architect may not come to her materials with a hypothesis well in hand or even a series of well-formulated questions to guide her way. Although we can understand creative expression in terms of actions and practices that come back to us as knowledge, they also come back as other things, as provocations, as triggers, as propositions, experiential encounters, perceptual events. 
Art in particular can only perform itself as research retroactively, given that we don't know what, it, what its outcomes and effects are necessarily going to be in advance. Now this condition of uncertainty and unknowability as to the relevance of one's work is not, of course, specific to the arts and is perhaps less commonly considered to be an important conceptual resource within the sciences where research questions, methodological approaches, and the significance and contributions of one's work prevails as the dominant, dominant rubric for securing research support and funding. Um, and I might say that increasingly there's a lot of um, pressure or, or there's a demand on scientists to also consider public engagement in relationship to their in relationship to the grants that they apply for to secure their sort of funding so public engagement might, might be one of the sites in which science brushes up against art but then you know then one might ask you know there is the role of artistic practice simply that of um, sort of public narration or simplification, if you will, of certain scientific kinds of uh, practices or procedures. Someone that's been a really important to me is, is the Belgian philosopher of science, Isabel Stengers. And she has often cautioned that our researchers must accept the possibility that it is not the human, but the material that asks the questions, that has a story to tell, which one must learn to unravel. Stengers admonishes researchers who come to their subjects with an elaborate hypothesis at the ready that they merely seek to validate. And she says, I'm beginning to suspect that a large part of the research has been done with the ulterior motive of imposing an answer on it. If only we were content to let the material speak. My own experience seems to suggest that while practice-based programs have been adapting to standardized paradigms and reconfiguring themselves to meet accepted models of research making, this has largely been a one-way street. And we can see that in all of the sort of research councils operating in places that I've lived and worked, Canada, which would be the social, it's SHIRC, Social Studies and Humanities Research Council. In Britain, it's the Arts and Humanities Research Council. So we really see the ways in which artistic practice has to adapt to these already, uh, already um, sort of already uh, preconceived notions of what might constitute uh, research and its methods. So the question arises, then how might various forms of practice also raise reciprocal challenges for other disciplines where the question of what constitutes legitimate research has a taken for granted status? By picking and choosing certain practices as more re relevant and diminishing others, valuable new tools for thinking may be lost, Stengers has said. Now, further to a discussion of the relationship between research and practice, I think, is the related discussion between theory and praxis. So while these notions somehow seem eternally locked together, I think it's important to articulate the particularities that underscore them as indexing differently constituted realms of inquiry, only some of which actually lead to the production of knowledge, or what has also been called by scholars like Gerit, new critical epistemologies. How might we continually think and work through the kinds of material and conceptual operations that take place within studio and practice-led environments without necessarily positing them in opposition to each other? The point is rather to insist that practice is already always a form of theory making, but that only under certain conditions can practice make intelligible intellectual and theoretical resources that might at some future junction be understood as research. This is not to say that the terms theory and practice are interchangeable or reducible to one another, but rather that their conjoined nature is such that the expression of one is necessarily included in the expression of the other as a production of difference rather than a reduction to sameness. By doing theory, we're also doing practice, but we're doing it differently. Likewise, by engaging in practice, we are sometimes also producing research. However, research achieves its legibility from practice and vice versa only when conditioned by rigorous critical reflection. 
and analytic and retrospective process in which the formative inquiries that impel art making are understood as mattering differently for the different kinds of practices in which they each have stakes. Another of our primary tasks, I think, is to ultimately discern the various practices for which certain kinds of questions, certain modes of public narration, and certain material investigations still matter. Only then can we gain insight into the ways in which different practices necessarily produce different kinds of knowledges. And maybe another couple of uh, thoughts that come out of my long, uh, long-standing kind of teaching career, especially within the Canadian context where I, I did work exclusively in a studio arts environment. And there, um, postgraduate students at various moments would articulate that the theoretical demands placed on their studio practices were oppressive and placed greater emphasis upon the thinking and the writing about rather than the actual doing of art. And I think their perception, of course, was not inaccurate if theory and practice are not understood and consequently, consequently mobilized as intertwined, albeit distinctive domains of creative and critical practice. The challenge is not simply finding time to work in the studio or to write about ideas, but the greater challenge is to maintain a consistent balance between thinking creatively and working materials rigorously. As we well know, creativity often operates at its, at its most intensified level when one is confronted with a condition in which there's seemingly little latitude or room to maneuver. And we countered that some of this just the other day when we were doing our field work and when I, students were talking about their experience in the industrial park in the, uh, when we were working in the Rotterdam port. Um, another um, observation that came to me when working in Canada was that students often capitulated to the demands of their graduate programs in ways that suggested they were unable to think through or work around a situation creatively and use it to their own advantage. So another task, and that is to, you know, an, another task would be to creatively respond to a situation or perceived obstacle so that it enters into a productive relay with one's own particular interests investigations. This is where creativity really resides, though I fully acknowledge that a certain amount of confidence and an understanding of one's agency is, is absolutely um, essential. It takes time, it's very hard to do, but it's absolutely kind of necessary. So to help students adapt problematics in ways that are meaningful to their own work should be one of our primary goals as, as teachers working within higher education, as well as a shared responsibility among students themselves. This is not simply the same as saying, let's do away with certain parameters of our programs as they've been conceptualized, but rather to explore how these parameters might be reimagined in ways that are mutually productive. Ultimately, I'm committed to ed uh, education as a collective project, but recognize that it is expressed by many heterogeneous and intensive projects that need to assemble across incommensurabilities and even call into question that which we, and even call into question that which we share. While there are emergent processes that can happen organically as students gather together in self-organizing groups and engage in peer-to-peer -peer learning, they can also be evolved through the structural and formal elements of a program. The broader framework of graduate education, therefore, must enable students to make connections at all levels, as well as between other research and creative clusters in other institutions and in other contexts. And this is very much something that we've tried to do here in Amsterdam and Rotterdam with between the Center for Research Architecture and um, all of this the staff and the infrastructural support of Sonic X. And so to conclude my um, brief set of comments, I really feel that the question of who we are institutionally as staff and as students within pedagogical environments, that is to say within academies, and what we do must ultimately be coupled with a much more urgent question which is, how is a subject of any kind produced in the world, socially, politically, ethically, and aesthetically? And I would like to leave my comments there and uh, open up to what I think, I know will be a fantastically enriching day. So I look forward to uh, the 
all of the presentations and performances and screenings that are to come. So thank you very much for the invitation to uh, start off the day here.